Thanks, everyone. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for the kind introduction. We thank you as well for your service in the state legislature. We're really grateful that you're here, as well as all the other elected officials from across our state and all of you who are engaged here in this, this, this most important exercise of America. That's exercising our right and our duty to self-governance and upholding the principles and the ideals of liberty that undergird the very freedoms that we hold. So I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you today in saying hello and expressing my gratitude for all of your willingness to be here. Now, as Republicans, we have an interesting characteristic. We're all kind of independent. That's a mark of being a Republican. So when we gather here in one setting, that is also a remarkable time to work out our differences, to think through what we have in common, and then to move forward and get behind the people who we will trust to place our judgment, to, to place our vote before, in front of, and who we trust their judgment to pursue the ideals that this country was founded upon. On my way out here, I was thinking about a, a story, um, and this is actually true, a, a New York radio station once called me, and they wanted to talk about Nebraska. They wanted to know why Nebraska's measures of well-being, social, economic, and otherwise, are off the charts as compared to the rest of America. And for the briefest moment, I almost gave them a one-word answer. For the briefest moment, I almost said, detasseling. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, I have five daughters, and two of them are involved in detasseling right now, as I was coming from Lincoln out to the, Lincoln on this lovely morning, looking at the fields that are for seed corn and being detasseled. I was reflecting on that and thinking about one of my children who's out there right now. But the reality is here are kids who volunteer to sign up, to go into a field when it's cold and wet, in the unseemly hour in the morning. That's why my wife brings them to their bus. <laughs> They work all day long until it's blistering hot, fighting off corn rash and insects the entire time, getting paid the most minimalist of wages, and willingly do it the next day. I, told, I tell this story because it's this earliest connection between effort and reward that is an operative principle in our culture here in Nebraska. And one of the reasons that we measure so well is because this is the formative ideals that our young people come up with. That hard work and personal responsibility and all the other values that we tend to take for granted, Senator Jansen talked about them, but are essential that there is importance to investing time and energy in community. It is important to invest time and energy in family life, in faith life. It is important to uphold a sense of business ethics, and it's important to do our duty as citizens to uphold this American principle of self-determination. That's our responsibility. So I'm proud that we as Republicans are gathered here to work that process out as messy as it sometimes can be. A few months ago, I was in Bellevue, Nebraska, and I had the real privilege of meeting a gentleman who was over 90 years old, and he walked slowly with a cane, but he had a very stately quality to him. His face just projected an image of wisdom and strength. And he raised his, his hand and he asked me a question. He said, um, Congressman, this time, do you think we can muddle through? My friends think we can. I'm not so sure. This man had been a bomber pilot in World War II. He had flown 28 missions from England to Germany, which is an incredible number considering the, the casualty rate. And that's what he asked me, this time can we muddle through? And I gave him my answer, and when I was done, he calmly replied, he said, Congressman, it feels to me like this is 1938. And those words have stayed with me ever since. Now what was he saying? We're not facing the same type of threat as we were in 1938, the threat of fascism or communism or totalitarianism. Our threats from the outside are, are different and complex based upon a more integrated and globalized world, based upon new ideologies that are now funded and don't have nation state status. We all know that. 
Our threats internally, though, there has some parallel. We're in the midst of an economic situation where we don't have clarity as to how we're going to come out of it. But I wondered if my friend was also reflecting on what we are all intuiting, this bur burden we feel in our hearts, that somehow we've got to restore some of the traditional ideals that have made America great. The ideal that it's the institutions in our culture that give rise to good formation and therefore good outcomes, whether that's family life or faith life or civic organizations. The ideal that we've got to shed ourselves of apathy. We can complain about all the poor politicians out there, but you know what? Whose responsibility is it? It's ours, collectively. The idea that we have got to figure out a way to stop investing so much energy, anxiety, money, and therefore debt in a more centralized system based in Washington, D.C., and return to some basic concepts of federalism where we spread out our governing structures so that those who are closest to the problem or opportunity are empowered to actually solve the problem or seize the opportunity. That used to be what was operative in our culture. And that, frankly, that is a great divide in, in this particular election. Are we going to invest more and more in a centralized structure of governance in Washington, or are we going to return to the concept that Washington and the federal government has certain public goods that it can deliver, and rightfully so, but there are other institutions, both of, cu of, of culture as well as throughout society, that have essential roles as well in keeping alive the great concepts of strong family and strong communities that make a strong nation. And I think there's a real divide here. That's why it's so beautiful, frankly, to see all of you gathered to take, who are taking time away from your family and your other activities you could be involved in today to come to Grand Island, one of the great cities in our community. By the way, Mayor Vav Vavrishek throws a great party here, doesn't he? He's just done a great job. And so I didn't go into all of that on that New York radio station, but I basically told them three things. One is we have a strong ag economy. We have good stewards in our farmers and ranchers. Two, we're a very entrepreneurial state. 80% of the people in Lincoln work in small businesses, 80 people and under. And you know what? We didn't have any real banking problems, a few here and there. Our business investment industry, our banking industry, didn't go off and create exotic financial instruments that make no sense. We didn't do all that. Our people didn't take advantage of liberalized credit. We have the lowest home foreclosure rate in the country, one of the lowest. We didn't do all that. It's a marked character of our state, and that character comes from somewhere. It comes from the fields where people use the gifts of their labor to make things, to grow things, to feed the rest of the world. It comes from entrepreneurial risk-taking. It comes from investment in the concepts of family and pouring that into strong communities. When you do those kinds of things, you return to some basic ideals that have given rise to the strength of this very country. And I think that's what's going on here as we all try to sort through what is burdening us about the direction of the country and what can we can do politically about it. Now, I have to call a little bit of, a, of an audible here because uh, as Senator Jansen was saying, uh, he had to off the cuff introduce me and I was supposed to introduce State Senator Deb Fisher, who is going to be our next United States Senator. But you know what? I'm going to have to issue a slight apology for the Senator because she's not here because I know she'd be mortified that she's running late, but she's exactly where she should be. She was in a parade in Scotts Bluff. She's probably been delayed shaking hands with people. We know her. We, we're going to love her. We're all going to get behind her, but she's got to convince other people out there. So I think we can give, give her a little bit of an excuse, don't you think? So. <laughs> it's my understanding that she'll be here in about an hour or so, but uh, I hope that you'll join with me in, in really rallying, rallying your energy and your resources behind Senator Fisher. Senator Fisher is a wife, she was trained as an educator, and she's a rancher. She is Nebraskan through and through. She was born in Lincoln, but was married shortly after college, as I understand it, and swept off her feet to a ranch out in western Nebraska. 
So she knows our state intimately. She's served very capably as a sitting state senator. And she worked aggressively to position herself where she is now. She tackled tough issues on infrastructure and spending. She's been creative, she's been malleable, but she also has that independent spirit, which again is a mark of Nebraskan and a mark of a lot of Republicans, and I think that's important. So I think she has an extraordinary chance this fall. I think she is going to serve not only capably, but extraordinarily well in the United States Senate. The day after her election, she kind of swept into town, at least her name did. I was in Washington. Speaker of the House even looked at me and said, Ford Mayor, Ford Mayor, she going to win? Yes, sir, she's going to win. <laughs> and I think she will win with our help. And so that's our next, next task. We're going to have to elect Gov Governor Romney to the presidency. We've got extraordinary state senators who are running for re-election, a lot of local campaigns as well. But the United States Senate is something that we can all directly impact. It's going to get a bit messy. It's going to, there's going to be rancor and divisiveness. You can, we, we had a conversation with Governor Jindal earlier. We were elected to Congress at the same time, by the way. And he was talking about the amount of money that's going to be poured into the national election and just how disturbing all of that is going to be to all of us and how fatiguing it is. So we have to work this thing to the finish. And I know Deb Fisher is going to be proud to stand for you shortly and give you an overview of what her vision is and how she's going to do great things for Nebraska, but also this country. So let me conclude by saying thank you all so much for the extraordinary privilege that you've invested in me as a member of the United States Congress. I'm, a, I'm actually very proud to be a member of that institution, even though it has an 11% approval rating. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who these 11% of the people are that really like us. <laughs> I, th I think my mother's in that category. But, but nonetheless, we can't constantly tear down the institutions that govern us. We can't do it. We have to get in there, revive them, attach ourselves to the great tradition of this country, then represent it in this time in our culture so that we are proper stewards of the very ideals that have given rise to our liberty, our freedom, that we are so well exercising today. Thank you all for what you're doing. Thank you all for supporting me. Thank you all for supporting Deb Fisher. God bless you.